Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, my final master's project that I did this year for the University of Kentucky. Um, it's an interactive map that looks at the intersection of uh, socially vulnerable communities and wildfire hazard potential in the contiguous United States. So the inspiration and motivation for this project was really based on the increasing frequency, size, and intensity of wildfires that we're seeing throughout the world, but also you know, in the western United States where I live. Um, it's a, very much a reality for me and, and people I know. And, um, and so I really wanted to know more about um, areas of human habitation that were being impacted by fires. Um, on this slide are images of Paradise, California, um, from above during uh, the 2018 campfire and then a couple of post post campfire images um, during uh, that fire or sorry the community of paradise uh, was considered basically a, not a well-to-do community a lot of people went to that town because they could still afford to live in the mountains of California um, but there was a lot of people who suffered and didn't have a lot of resources after Paradise or, or the campfire came through and basically decimated the entire town. So that was sort of the, the reason why I sort of wanted to take on this project. So the map is for uh, potential users um, looking to understand not only how wildfire um, can affect developed areas and, and their inhabitants, but also serve as an initial planning tool. Um, used to aid and mitigate human suffering and financial loss to the identification of, de of developed areas uh, that may be in greater need of additional support prior to and after wildfires. So I used three uh, data sets to, to look at and sort of answer some of the, the questions and ultimately map them. Um, they were census designated places, which are basically polygons of unincorporated areas throughout the contiguous United States, wildfire hazard potential, which is a 270 meter uh, small scale raster, and finally, um, a social vulnerability index, which is a uh, polygons at the census tract level. So census designated places came from the US Census Bureau, obviously. They are uh, statistical geographies uh, representing closely settled, unincorporated communities that are locally recognized and identified by name. Um, they were chosen because they commonly lack emergency services at the municipal level and rely more heavily on county-based services and are often in more rural, fire-prone areas. Um, and also, census-designated places were basically the mini minimum mapping unit I used for the project, so the smallest rep representation of geography. Uh, so wildfire hazard potential, like I said, was a small-scale raster data set at 270 meters per pixel um, from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, it was developed uh, from vegetation and wildland fuel models and intended to be used sort of in concert with spatial data depicting highly valued resources, i.e. communities, infrastructure, etc. Um, it consists of five classes from very low to very high wildfire hazard potential. Um, and for this study, the data were filtered to only include classes that include moderate to very high. So a third data set used was the uh, Social Vulnerability Index. And um, the CDC defines social vulnerability um, as the potential negative effects on communities caused by external stresses or on human health, such as um, natural or human-caused disasters or disease outbreaks. So as I got into the project, I initially was thinking I was going to create my own vulnerability index, but quickly discovered that that could be a master's thesis in and of itself. Um, so uh, I began searching for existing data sets. It proved to be kind of a challenge to find uh, data that would scale appropriately for the census designated places that I was interested in. Um, so I ultimately landed on the, uh, the, the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, um, which is at the tract level. Um, and they contain uh, relative vulnerability with four core themes plus an overall theme. So the graphic on this page outlines the four uh, vulnerability themes that I worked with. Um, they include socioeconomic status, 
housing composition and disability, minority status and language, housing type and transportation, and then as you can see on the left there, overall vulnerability. So I used a few different um, analysis methods um, and tools to, to basically come up with usable data to actually plot. Um, and I had to like make sense of it and scale it and do a bunch of things. So basically I used zonal statistics, um, a spatially weighted mean analysis, and I did this with a variety of tools including Jupyter Notebooks, Pandas, Geo Geopandas, Matplotlib, Raster.io, Shapely, and QGIS, among others. The map was ultimately created in um, Leaflet. So zonal, stat zonal statistics uh, were used to basically assign a wildfire hazard potential class um, to the census designated places. This method basically calculates a defined statistic on cell values within an area or zone of another data set. In this case, the zones are the census designated places and the raster is the wildfire hazard potential uh, pixel value. So the stat statistic that I calculated uh, was basically the majority or the most of a single pixel value that existed within a zone, a census designated place. So as you, as you can see from the graphic on this, uh, on this slide, um, the pixel value of five is the most common. It has, it has 14 pixels inside that zone. So in a case like this, um, it would be assigned the, the majority of five and, or in other words, a uh, very high wildfire hazard potential. So um, we can see the results of the zonal statistics here on this slide um, where a majority class has been assigned. On the left, uh, it, uh, the more dense map with 32,188 records was basically majority for every single of the five classes in wildfire hazard potential. Um, I ultimately had to filter these down to those three classes that I've been mentioning throughout this presentation, um, which were just high or moderate high and very high, and that got me down to about 2,854 records. It took a very long time to apply those zonal statistics to those 32,000 records. So the second analysis I performed was a spatially weighted mean. This process basically calculates the value of a polygon inside another polygon and gives those that consume more area greater importance or weight. Uh, the graphic here helps sort of illustrate that point um, where you see the nine square mile area is weighted more heavily than the six square mile area and so on. This is basically used because uh, CDPs or the, sorry, census designated places are the minimum mapping unit displayed in the map and the social vulnerability index data was at the tract level, which is too detailed for the study. So I needed a way to generalize the social vulnerability um, while ensuring that the attributes continue to accurately represent that, that attribute. So um, the values for each vulnerability theme and the overall vulnerability theme are averaged based on the tract area they occupy inside each one of the 2,854 census designated uh, place polygons that they intersect with. So the results of the spatially weighted mean are then joined together and dissolved into a single geometry holding four individual themes plus the overall theme for each census designated place. The themes in the top 10% are given a value of one to, to indicate high vulnerability and tracks below that are given a, um, uh, are given a value of zero. So the results when mapped then range from zero to one and have a five value classification assigned uh, to each theme. So as you can see here, low, low, moderate, moderate, high, moderate, and high. Um, we have a sort of a case study example here in Access, Alabama, which has the following spatially, spatially weighted mean values. Um, let's see, 0.65 or high moderate for socioeconomic status. Household composition and disability is uh, high or moderate as well, 0.71. Minority status and language, 0.18 or low. Um, housing type and transportation also, 0.14 or low, and finally, the overall theme that averages uh, all the individual values with a value of 0.39 or low to moderate, those last two values skewing that overall theme down just a little bit. So I ultimately took those polygons and then um, converted them to centroids so I could begin to think about mapping the data at multiple scales. Um, 
Let's see, uh, where am I? Um, yeah, so the map uses diff different thematic representations at different scales. Uh, at zoom levels of less than 10, it uses graduated symbology to display the overall social, social vulnerability index theme by census designated place and sequential colors to display the three class wildfire hazard potential, uh, which resulted in a bivariate map. At the same zoom level, there's also a tooltip used to indicate census designated place name, um, wildfire hazard potential, and the overall social vulnerability index. So that's basically uh, the result of all the things I just described. Um, as you can see, the map suffers from a bit of overplotting. There's also um, a search tool at the top that allows you to kind of zoom in and explore um, the, the data at greater detail, which I'll describe here in a sec. So at zoom levels greater than or equal to 10, the uh, census designated place polygons are displayed in their actual geometry. Um, when a census designated place is, is selected at the maximum scale, um, a fly to event takes place. So the map zooms automatically to um, that location. The base map changes to become a, um, an aerial image so the user can get sort of a, um, on the ground sort of condition assessment by, by inspecting the map. Um, and then um, the sequential colors for the wildfire hazard potential class are maintained. Um, and then there's a pop-up at this scale that, that has a more granular breakdown of all the different social vulner vulnerability index themes. Um, I should also add that you can, as I said already, you can, you can use the search tool if you know exactly where you want to look um, to get to a specific um, area or census designated place. So that's the result of clicking or using the search tool to zoom onto the map. You can see the breakdown of all the uh, vulnerability index indices. The, um, the census designated place is highlighted with a, with a dashed outline. Um, and you can continue to pan around directly from here. I'm avoiding a demo today just because the map it can be a little cumbersome under um, unpredictable Wi-Fi. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, um, you know, the map has some limit limitations and, I, and I've been thinking about some potential improvements to it. It suffers from some overplotting at small scale. Um, this could potentially be mitigated by um, uh, removing maybe the moderate class or allowing a direct filter on classification type from moderate to very high, um, or maybe sort of having it be broken up into specific regions, California, Oregon, et cetera. Um, it also suffers from some slow performance for that reason, um, and the above issue could potentially help with some of that or some additional server-side uh, processing. Um, so uh, the other things I wanted to mention were the idea of potentially building in some additional components to the social vulnerability, like looking at transportation um, and emergency access routes into and out of communities. Uh, one of the biggest issues um, why the death rate was so high in the Paradise Campfire was that there's one road in and out of that town and people didn't, there was basically a traffic jam. Um, and people, you know, basically were, were killed by the fire in, in, in their cars as they were trying to get out of town. Um, the other thing that I, I considered doing was adding a bar chart in the pop-up to allow an additional visual aid to allow comparison of the, addition, of the additional um, uh, individual vulnerability uh, index values. So the intent of the map was simple, basically to locate and identify where specific communities have some level of wildfire risk and overlapping uh, vulnerability. With the information in the map, I'm hoping planners, emergency responders, and other public officials can potentially use it as a tool to work to allocate um, additional funding, estimate needed supplies, uh, where shelters may be needed, create evacuation plans, and identify places where long-term support following a fire event may be needed. It also uncovers regions uh, where that are surprising in terms of their wildfire hazard potential, such as the southeast. In this regard, um, I feel like the map just raises more questions than it actually answers around climate change, um, if things like that. So there's a link to my uh, both my web portfolio on the project GitHub uh, here, and thanks a lot for coming. Me, I'm 
from the west, and I look at that map and I see a lot of light in the west and in the southeast, as you said, it's kind of surprisingly showing a lot of fire potential. In my mind, I would see fires definitely possible in the southeast, but their potential to spread is considerably restricted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I think the other thing that you're seeing in that map is the limitation of you know, I was constraining it by the geography of the census designated yeah. places. So if I was just plotting just wildfire hazard potential on its own, you would see it would be very, very different. Um, I, do not, I don't think so. I think it's, you know, they do basic general fuel modeling because it's such a small scale map there. Like, you know, the pixels are very large. Um, and, and most, like, from what I know about fire data, like, there are separate models that are generated, like that determine things like rate of spread or like the ability from fire to jump, you know, between canopies of trees, and that's often a function of sort of poor forest management practices that have existed in the West for a long time. Um, yes, and I, I feel like probably not because I feel like the base, the, the core data would still probably ultimately come from the census because those, that's the sort of agency that tracks a lot of this information. I mean, one thing um, uh, that I did, you know, I looked at some dif different definitions of what social vulnerability meant, like even defined by like more, more global organizations, um, but it was roughly all the same. And there was also a, um, one of the things that also inspired this talk that I didn't, that I didn't talk about much was... Um, the governor's office in California um, basically requested CAL FIRE, which is the main fire agency in California, to develop a report around social vulnerability based on areas of fuel treatment that they had already planned. So they basically were planning to do this work. They had funding to do it, but they were using the treatment areas that they had defined already to sort of then figure out where the vulnerable communities were in proximity to that. So it's almost a bit of the inverse of what I was doing. Um, and they were using they were using essentially the same thing. So you know, sadly, there's one there's one sort of core source that detracts all this data in the U.S. So, hi. I think it does. It depends. You know, it depends on when it's updated. You know, like I mean, this is this is actually I think was updated in 2020, so it's relatively new. So it would take into account vegetation changes that have happened when they rerun the models, right? And what's going on on the ground for sure. So when you say blowdowns, like blow, large blowdowns of trees, yeah, I mean. That's very, that's very common. I don't know that this data would be that granular in terms of like picking up. I mean, that's almost like you need to you have LIDAR to pick up those returns to understand that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.